joyful gathering spiritual center, that's all of us, are, uh, I am anyway, so happy to welcome Reverend Dr. Jerry Troya, who is still, and hopefully for a long time, the president <laughs> of Affiliated New World Work Network, which is ANTN, our, if you will, our mother organization, the one that we all, we belong to. All of us belong to this organization. In fact, there is a whole group of us, and you're going to uh, witness that um, ordination kind of ceremony here, joyful gathering in November. But they are being ordained in Anton, and so um, Dr. Jerry is a part of, and not only part of it, he's the president of it. So we're so grateful that he is here with us. He is the author of an acclaimed new book coming out to ourselves, admitting, accepting, and embracing who we truly are. He serves as the staff minister, how lucky are they, at OWN's Center for Spiritual Living in San Diego area, so he's from California, and he flew all the way here to be with us yeah, only. Yeah. So we're very, yeah, yeah, we're very grateful for that. And he has been, Jerry has been a student of New Thought for over 30 years, as I have. We must have started at the same time. So, oh, Ron, we're also on camera right now. So we welcome um, our friend, I believe he is our dear friend, Reverend Dr. Jerry Troy. Good morning, dear ones in this very room. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, if you're watching us later. It is such a great joy to be with you all at Joyful Gathering on this absolutely gorgeous, oh my goodness, yes. September day. Isn't it amazing out there? Yes. Uh, good fall, fall and, we were talking about this before, but fall and spring. You know, and, and you gotta go shovel the walk and all the rest of that, or you gotta turn up the air conditioning because it's so humid, but fall and spring, just so gorgeous. We don't have that so much in San Diego. Um, it's, the Chamber of Commerce says it's 75 degrees year round. We, we uh -huh. variate a little bit from that, but it's just a different experience. But such a great joy to be with you. Reverend Margaret, as, as Reverend Margaret mentioned, she, she kind of, she kind of bit on me and won me. Um, and and it, it's one of my great joys at the, at the auction. Seriously, this happened at the, uh, we do an auction every year at the Anson um, retreat at Unity Village. And one of the things that I place in the auction is to come and visit you or, or different um, congregations and centers and churches. And I come and speak into a workshop and so forth, and it's just so much fun. And so it's such a great joy to be back with you. Thank you for that. Bring your credit card with you because we're going to do this again in two weeks. <laughs> so my topic for today is hanging out in the circle. You might not remember all the details of the day and the time and all the rest of that, but at some point, you got bored. Everybody in this room, everybody that's watching us online, everybody that will watch us later, at some point we got bored. And when that happened, the world kind of revolved around us. So I'm tired, I'm uncomfortable, I'm hungry, and we might have made our wishes known at the top of our lungs, and ideally there was somebody to respond, because the world revolved around us, and that was just fine. But then down the road, we started to learn about what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, what's acceptable and what's not. If you come from traditional Christianity, one of the things you might have learned, learned or were taught at an early age was about original sin. And this is gonna sound funny, but I love to talk about this concept because how many of us carry that belief still to this very day, years, decades, centuries later, 
that we're somehow bad, that we're somehow wrong, that we're somehow intrinsically evil, that we're somehow not enough. And so often we carry this belief and this residue with, for lack of a better word, with us, and the decisions we make in our lives are based on what we believe about ourselves. And if we're not enough, then we might not have enough, we might not do enough, we might not be enough, and I'll talk much more about that as we go along. It's that domestication, and remember in, um, in the book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, he talks about our domestication and, and what we were taught growing up and that, uh, that, that we carry all of that stuff, using a purely metaphysical term, <laughs> with us for however long, unless and until we decide to say, no, wait just a minute, this doesn't make sense for me anymore. So depending on what you were taught growing up and your circumstances, you might have been, and especially in like grade school and high school, you might have been one of the cool kids. And I don't know about your, I know, right? I, I don't know about your experience, but the cool <laughs> kids were height and weight appropriate. <laughs> they were, they might have been athletic, but they just, they dressed nice, they looked nice, they, they were a little snarky probably because you don't want to be too nice because that's part of your, you know, part of your persona is to be nice but not too nice. And they were, pro they probably looked like, that they were probably this color, they were probably white, or, or and, and so there was a whole long list of things and they were probably straight. I wasn't a lot of those things and so I wasn't one of the cool kids. The cool kids were somehow enough. But I grew up with a belief, and absolutely not giving blame to anybody else, it was my deal, I grew up with a belief that I was somehow not enough. The cool kids, the kids in the circle, were. So what I'd like to start out with this morning is a short process talking about this experience of being one of the cool kids and being in the circle. So I invite you to get comfortable where you are, close your eyes if you'd like. And go with me on a walk. It's an absolutely gorgeous day, feels a lot like today, out in the sunshine, in the, in the warm, sunshine in the warm breeze but not humid just absolutely gorgeous gorgeous day and we walk along and we walk through the woods and we smell the pine trees <clears throat> and we feel the pine needles crunching under our feet as we walk and we come around we're walking on a path and we walk along and we come out into this clearing and off in the distance, there's this huge circle in, the, in a massive field. Streams and springs flow in and out of this area and this circle. The circle is not one made by human hands, but it's a circle of energy, the flow of the universe, flowing without restriction. You see the circle and you see all these people and they're having so much fun and they look wonderful and they're acting wonderful and they're so happy and they're so abundant and they're in the circle. The circle is the home to, and we're standing, we're looking off at this circle. The circle is a home to a flow of satisfying relationships, meaningful work, endless resources and opportunities, laughter and creativity, and an overwhelming sense of ease and grace and joy. We can, we're, we're, we can see it in the distance, but we feel that energy of that, of that passion and that wonder and that laughter and that, that experience. Glad and happy assurance. 
There's no fence around this circle. There's no admission gate, no entry fee. And as we look closer, we see that there are people of all different shapes and sizes and ages and colors and backgrounds are all in the circle. And as we look closer, we see there's our place. It's right there. It's right there. So we walk, we run. We run through this meadow, we run, run through this open field and take our place in the circle. And we feel that lusciousness, that love, that passion, that sense of belonging. Because it's our place. It's always been there waiting for us. Now, step back out of the circle and back up a few steps and feel what you feel. Separate, envious, disconnected, but maybe familiar, because if we've not recognized that our place in the circle has always been there, it might be strange. What? I'm loved? What? I'm abundant? What? I'm the beloved? Now step back into the circle and feel that flow. Your place, my place, is the truth of my be our being. It's not determined by what we did or what we're going to do. It's not determined by anybody else. It's determined by the fact that we are the beloved. Now, keep in mind that the circle is not a place. It's a way of living. <sighs> nice deep breath, and when you're ready, come back into the circle, back, back into the room. When we're not living in the circle, and keeping in mind just because we're not there doesn't mean our place has gone, it's there for us. But when we're not living in the circle, we can feel like we're not enough. We don't have enough. We didn't do enough. And how often in the morning do we start out our day with in this experience of not enoughness? And I don't know if that's a word, but I used it, so it's a word now. But that not enoughness of, I didn't get enough sleep. I didn't get enough coffee. I don't have enough time. There aren't enough parking places. There's not enough money. And because life always says yes to us as we know, then that becomes our experience throughout the day. And if you've ever had that experience, you know what I'm talking about, that we go through the rest of the day, there's not enough, and there's not enough food at home, and I don't know what I'm gonna make for dinner, and I don't have enough time to do that, and there's not enough space on the bridge to get across because the traffic is so heavy, and so it goes, and so it goes, and so it goes. Growing up, I was not in the circle, and maybe you weren't as well, even though it was always there. It was always there, just I didn't know until 30 years ago. Good God, how <laughs> depressing is it? No, it's not. Amazing. <laughs> However long, and if, you, if this is your first time ever in a religious science center, I'm so glad you're here. And if you've been in the teaching for centuries and decades and all the rest of that, that's okay too. Because what I love about this teaching is we're always learning. We're always expanding. We're always being reminded of the truth of who we are. So what keeps us what keeps our place in the circle vacant because we're off someplace else? It might be shame. Shame about being adopted. Shame about something that happened in our lives. Something about the color of our skin or our sexual orientation. 
just something about us that we just don't want to look at and it and it it almost hurts our soul to even think about it that we just put off to the side and carry with us for however long One of the things I love about doing what I do and sharing these ideas in workshops is because I get the most amazing, we have the most amazing conversations and I'll do three or four shameless advertisements for the workshop afterwards. But I hope you'll, I hope you'll plan to stay after the, after the service for the workshop. The first time I did this in its current form, I was in a, a little Unity church in the Dallas area, and we were talking about this experience of shame and of being outside the circle. And one of the women, and this just so touched my heart, one of the African-American women in the, in the circle that we were talking about shared her experience of passing. And this, so touched my heart and I had not heard the term before and wisdom comes in the strangest places. There was a Law and Order episode on several years ago and the, the man that was accused of murdering his wife, which he did not do by the way, but that's separate, <laughs> but he was light-skinned African-American and he talked about his experience of passing and that's when when you are African American, but you're lighter skin, and so you pass as white. And lived his life on, on, the, on the TV show as a white person. And the, and the woman in my workshop talked about her experience of passing. And she felt she had to do that because admittedly, and especially back 20, 30, 40 years ago, white people very often had different opportunities and a different experience from people, non-white people. And so this woman in my workshop talked about her experience and the shame because she felt she had to do that so that she could have a better life but then how she was shamed and ostracized from her family because she was the only one in the family. And if you've ever lived with the experience of trying to be someone you're not and feeling like you have to be even though it's not the truth of your being, it can be incredibly painful and incredibly difficult because you're kind of you're 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 trying to be in the circle but you're not really in the circle and those of us in the LGBTQ community get that we absolutely get that so so my the, just an, an amazing amazing um, conversation we might have shame about our money so I do, I do an awesome workshop about healing our relationship with money. So if that, we'll Here. talk about that maybe next year. <laughs> yes. or, or, or before, I'd even come in the snow. I'd, I, I, would, I would totally come back in the snow. But I talk about our, our relationship because we have one. And sometimes on Sunday morning we, we affirm we're abundant and we're, and we're lavish and there's more than enough and life is good and all the rest of that. And then we go home and try and figure out how to pay the rent the first of the month. Sometimes our relationship is with money is not all that it could be, and we could have shame about that. When we're in the circle, on the other hand, we experience inclusivity. We're included in the abundance, in the passion, in the love and the joy of the universe and everything that it brings. In the circle, we have connection with everybody that's there. Even though we look different and act different and have different goals, we honor and celebrate. You're on your path and that's awesome and I have no idea about your path. I'm on my path, but I honor and celebrate you. I love what y'all do. I love what y'all do in the community. It's just amazing and so touches my heart. And one of the things that Joyful Gathering does is support my organization, Urban Street Angels, in San Diego. And we're so grateful for that. So we provide housing, 
employment, job skills training, and education referrals to homeless 18 to 25 year olds. We have about 140 young people in San Diego who did not sleep on the street last night mm -hmm. because of one of our programs. Yeah. So I'm working with these 18 to 25 year olds and I'm, as you can, might be able to tell, I'm a little bit older than that. <laughs> and I had this thought, Jerry, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing with these young kids? Maybe, because even though, even our case managers, even our staff is between, most of them are between 25 and 30. And I had the thought of, well, maybe you should let younger people do this. And the still small voice said, no, because I bring and you bring wisdom and experience and guidance. And so this young woman came in and, and I'm, my, my desk is in a room full of case managers and peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer support people. And this young woman came in and she's so excited because she just got her first car. It's a BMW and she just paid a thousand dollars for it. Okay. <laughs> Ever had a used BMW? Not picking on BMWs, but a used something with over a hundred thousand miles on it. I said, that is so exciting, and you're going to get to drive to school and all the rest of that, and that's so wonderful, but remember, and I just take throwing water on people's parade, but I, I said, remember, you're going to have to have insurance to get it registered. She said, and in California, you need a smog certificate to get it registered, huh. and she said, oh and you need clear title. Did you get the paperwork? And she said, oh. So it turns out, the good news is, at least from my perspective, she didn't end up buying this BMW. But having bought and sold a few cars in my life, I, brought that, I was able to bring that wisdom and that grounding that somebody else might not have been able to. So, the good news is, I'm still there, and, I, and at least for the for the short term, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be there. The circle invites, encourages, and challenges each of us to come into the circle and stay in the circle with all of our and again using a purely spiritual term stuff. Remember the remember the great writing, the guest house by uh, Rumi, yeah. the Sufi mystic poet. He talks about all of our emotions, but I would suggest that everything, everything that's happened up till now that we carry with us are valuable. All of those experiences, all of those life lessons, all of those, all that goofiness, we recognize it for what it is. We don't allow it to affect our lives unless it makes sense for us, but we allow ourselves to, to keep it with us, those life lessons and those those heartbreaking and heart opening experiences. Being in the circle allows us to recognize and be reminded that this thing called life is ours. Uh, quoting Edwin Gaines, God doesn't have grandchildren. <laughs> so my relationship with my higher power, God, spirit, the universe, the infinite, the divine, whatever I choose to call it, is mine. And I so appreciate your wisdom. I so appreciate your, your experience. I so appreciate your advice on how I should live my life. That's very kind of you to, to share that with me. However, comma, it's my decision, not yours. But, have you ever really, I just really want to do this. I just really want to buy this. I just really want to have this. I really want to not do this. And you have that idea 
and you're just headed down the road to allow that to happen and you get the thought, but what will they think? <laughs> A big part of the, of the workshop and this theme that I'm talking about came from this wonderful book that I found on Facebook. And I love Facebook, that's a separate story, but I just do. The book is Radically Content by Jamie Veron. And she writes, what will they think is the question that robs us of our dreams and happiness more than any other. Who is they and why do we care so much about what they think? Who is this faceless group of people that is going to come for us if we don't measure up to their ideal? And why are we not really encouraged to examine this idea we take as an absolute inconvertible truth? How often do we base our decisions on worrying about what will they think? We do not need to spend our life in pursuit of achievements that have no real value to us internally. The goal is to be the most expressed version of yourself. You should feel free to jump in the pool with your bathing suit on, or not. <laughs> My words, not hers, I'm just saying. To wear sleeveless dresses, to love with abandon, to create the art that lights you up, to construct and build an entire life that is so you, there's no room for comparison. You deserve to love your life so much that it doesn't matter who affirms or denies you. <sighs> feels, that feels really, really good. <clears throat> Residing in the circle invites, encourages, and challenges us to make the decisions that make our tails wag. And sometimes it's a yes, I want to do that. And sometimes it's a no, that's not mine to do. This is big for me. And I didn't send Reverend Margaret an updated bio, but this is the first time, so I'm coming out to you this morning telling you that I am no longer a staff minister at OM Center for Spiritual Living in San Diego. And the reason for that is I've served the congregation for about eight years and within, and please understand there is no, there is no judgment. Well, no, there is no judgment in my heart about this, but within Centers for Spiritual Living, and this is the way they do it and it's their organization and that's okay, but within CSL, you do your thing and then you have, you have two years to when you're licensed and two years to be ordained. And because I did all of my educational work through Emerson Institute and they don't recognize Emerson, so there's some additional classes and some additional stuff that I had to do. And I just, I went through a lot of, a lot of soul searching, a lot of struggling with my ego, a lot of, and finally said, this is not mine to do. So I won't do those additional six classes. I won't, I won't. My ministry is going in a different way. Thank you. Thank you. And it was big because what will they think? Oh my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break my senior minister's heart. Will she still, will she still love me? How often do we base our decisions on the terror that if I say no, if I don't do this, they're not going to love me. See, the, and, and so I was going through this reasoning process and, the, and the, I didn't make the list, but I almost made the list of, of goods and bads and yeses and nos and, and so on. And what I was thinking was, okay, so you're gonna commit to do this. 
and maybe you've had this experience as well. So I say yes when I want to say no, and then I regret saying yes, and I resent you for even having the gall to ask me because you knew I was going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> or listen, listen, because we always know, we always know in our heart of hearts, we always know what is ours to do and what is ours not to do. And because I choose to be, and this is a process, not an event, but as I choose to be radically content, I can look at every area of my life and say, yeah, that makes my tail wag. And I said yes. And that doesn't make my tail wag. And I said no. And it feels, if you've had that experience, you know that feels so much better than the other way. How important it is for us to trust ourselves, to trust that still small voice, that inner wisdom, that intuition, whatever you choose to call it. How important it is to allow ourselves to do that. <laughs> Trusting ourselves, and this is another quote from, from Radically Content, self-trust is a personal revolution, and it's built the same way any other trust is built. It's earned. You have to keep your promises to yourself. You have to really listen to your own needs. You have to stop suppressing your emotions and instead hear them. This really lights me up. This really hurts. I'm really grieving about this. Whatever it is, allow ourselves to feel that to listen to it, to be with it, so that we can move past it. You have to learn to turn off the noise of the world and find the still, quiet whisper of your own intuition. You have to opt out of whatever is dulling you, whatever is unhealthy for you, and replace it with something generative and kind and peaceful. When you trust yourself, you hold yourself. It is knowing the difference between what's real within and what has been programmed into you. So because we're in Jersey, I kind of hear Frank Sinatra singing in the background, like in my way, you know? But you know what I mean? It just, I just, I really want to do that. And I don't have to, it doesn't have to make sense. I love you dearly, whoever you are. But I love you dearly, but it doesn't have to make sense to you. I don't have to explain it to you. I don't have to rationalize it to you because it's what I want to do. Because I'm not radically content. I'm not fully in the circle until I'm living my best life and you're living your best life. So why does it matter? Well, it matters because Life is lived, as we know, life is lived from the inside out. And if we look at that experience, again, in that resentment or in that regret, we just carry that, we schlep that along with us until we can look at it again and make a new decision, decide again. If we don't believe we're in the circle, if we don't believe we're enough, we might make decisions that are not in our best interest. Settle for the relationship that was just okay when it could have been amazing. Settle for the job that's just okay when there's something out there for us was just incredible. Miss out on the experiences that are there for us, but we didn't believe we could have them or deserve them. Reverend Margaret's theme for September is being a miracle worker. And what I know for us is as we start to say wholeheartedly yes and wholeheartedly no, it's like going to the gym. And that 
weight was too, almost too heavy, but I think I can lift it, I think I can lift it. And then the next time, it's a little easier. And then it's a little easier. And we're building that, that self-love and that self-integrity muscle to say what we, to say yes when it's ours to say and say no when it's ours to say and have this experience of being radically content and then watch as life opens up to us and as we do this for ourselves, we give other people permission to do the same. So as we do this, we are miracle workers. So with that in mind, join me in the light for just a minute. So in the peace and the quiet of this moment, staying in this consciousness of oneness, we allow ourselves today to retake our place in the circle, recognizing that we are the beloved, the essence and expression and experience of spirit, that there is nothing, never has been, never will be anything that can change this